It is almost unbelievable that our leaders have allowed the world situation to develop to this alarming degree. Time after time in the past 17 years since World War II, we have been warned by men like Dr. Walter Judd of Minnesota or Senator George Smathers of Florida, but we refuse to listen. We lost China. We lost North Korea. We lost Eastern Europe in conferences from Yalta to Geneva. In the last few months, we have lost Laos, we have allowed a wall to be built in Berlin. We have watched a communist buildup in Cuba. We vetoed the Bay of Pigs invasion 18 months ago. And we are planning, seemingly, further retreats, compromises, and deals, hoping that our pet theories that have brought us to this tragic hour will yet work. Some people are hoping and praying that somehow Khrushchev may be placated or changed. Don't we know that he has stated time after time that he means to conquer the whole world and that he hopes to do it in his lifetime? Don't we know that he laughs at us in our stupidity and frustration? He openly says that we are too decadent and soft to fight for our freedom. He openly said a few weeks ago that America is now in the hands of a group of liberals that will not let us fight for our freedoms and liberties. Is Khrushchev right? Are we going to be conquered as Rome was without even a fight? Whether you vote Republican or Democrat, I believe it is your duty to vote. Christians should pray that God will give you the courage to vote your convictions. And may God help us at this critical hour of history. A week ago today, we closed one of the greatest crusades we have ever conducted in the city of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Today, we are here in the city of El Paso, Texas, to begin another eight-day crusade in this booming Texas city. It is quite a shock to come back to the United States after several weeks in Latin America. Most of Latin America is sitting on a volcano, and you can sense the tenseness everywhere. Here in the comparative quietness of West Texas, it is difficult to imagine that the world is on the verge of gigantic explosions and upheavals. El Paso is a city of over 300,000 lying on the north bank of the Rio Grande River. On the other side of the river is Juarez, Mexico. These two cities are almost one as people cross the border freely to work in one or the other. Both English and Spanish are spoken here in El Paso, and some of our meetings will be through interpretation. Meetings have been scheduled across the border in Juarez, as the Christians have caught the vision of a major evangelistic penetration in both cities. The crusade here in El Paso had originally been booked in the 10,000-seat auditorium, but it soon became apparent to the committee that this was going to be too small as the interest has been gaining momentum throughout West Texas and New Mexico. In spite of the expected cold nights, the executive committee decided to move to an outdoor stadium to accommodate the crowds that want to hear the gospel. The meetings here are being sponsored by all the churches of every denomination, and thousands of people have been praying and preparing for this evangelistic effort. This past week, my wife and I spent a few days in Miami, Florida, on our way from Argentina to El Paso. The number one topic of conversation among our friends everywhere was Cuba. The people of Miami are deeply disturbed, and many are afraid at the gigantic communist buildup just a few miles from their shores. It is hard for people in Miami to understand the attitude of the government in allowing this situation to continue. Cuba is only one of the problems facing the world as we continue to move from crisis to crisis. When we left Argentina last Sunday night, the Christians sang to us, and as I looked into their faces, I wondered how many of them I would ever see again on this earth. Thousands of stalwart, godly men and women facing the possibilities of an unknown national future. Thousands of them were new believers that have come to know Jesus Christ in the last few days in the crusade in Buenos Aires. Then I remembered the glorious promises of Scripture concerning the future of those that love God. We read in 1 Thessalonians 4.15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we that are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 
Then the apostle Paul added these words, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When Christ comes for his church, it will be a personal coming. He is going to come in person. The angels at his birth announced a personal birth. His resurrection was a personal resurrection. And when he comes again for his own, it will be personal. His coming will also be an imminent coming. It could transpire at any time when the last soul has been saved and the body has been completed. None of us knows when it will be. We cannot set dates because he warned us not to. But he said, no man knoweth the day nor the hour. There is then a difference between the immediate return of Christ and the imminent return of Christ. We do not know the exact moment, but we do know that it is certain, imminent, and sure. And Paul said, in times of crisis and difficulty, encourage, build up, and comfort one another with this hope. However, he has given us spiritual discernment to read the signs of the times. And the times all point to the fact that he may come in our lifetime. We are told throughout the scriptures that we do not know when he's coming. Therefore, we are always to be watching, praying, and to be ready and to be busy about our master's business. In this passage that the Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonians, there are three things that will signal his coming. The first is the shout, and the shout is the loud summons or the command of the Lord, which will arouse the Christians from the graves. In other words, their spiritual ears are tuned to the frequency of his voice, and they will hear his shout and will come forth out of their graves. What a glorious hope we have in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul once said that if in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. There is coming a future event so astounding that only the eye of faith can see it, only the ear of faith can hear it, and only the mind of faith can perceive it. The dead in Christ shall rise from the dead. What a future we have to look forward to. What an encouragement that is to all believers today in areas of the world where there's suffering and persecution and difficulty. What scientific processes will be used to bring about the event of the rising of the dead? We do not know. But by faith, we accept the words of Holy Scripture that the same God that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead will also raise up those who have died in the Lord. Jesus taught that the gate to heaven is narrow. He said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life and few there be that find it. He warned against taking the broad road. This past week, Mr. John Bolton has been with us in Buenos Aires. We have been talking about the coming of the Lord. And he said one day at breakfast that Christ was born in a narrow manger, that his parents took him to Egypt on a narrow path, that he walked the narrow paths of Galilee. He died on a narrow cross, and they buried him in a narrow tomb. But on that first Easter morning, he arose from the dead with a dimension that enveloped the entire universe. Someday, our loved ones that we have laid tenderly away in a narrow grave are going to rise from the dead to a dimension of life that they never dreamed possible, even in their most glorious moments of spiritual living. Secondly, Paul teaches that there will be the voice of the archangel. There is apparently but one archangel in Scripture, and that is Michael. In the ninth verse of the book of Jude, we have a reference to Michael the archangel. When contending with the devil, he said, The Lord rebuke thee. Michael is usually associated in Scripture with Israel, as we see in the prophet Daniel. But he is also associated with the resurrection. Paul declared that immediately preceding Christ's coming, that the voice of the archangel will be heard. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Today, in a materialistic society, our ears are not tuned to the voice of angels. But the Bible says, the angels of the Lord encamp round about those that fear him. The Bible teaches the existence of angels. I believe these angels exist. But our ears today, because of the humdrum of our society, are not tuned to angels as the prophets of old out in the deserts. But someday, Michael's penetrating voice will burst upon our ears. And so powerful will be that voice that even the dead will stir in their graves and arise in resurrection power and glory to meet their Lord. 
Finally, there is the trump of God. And this trump is the heralding note of the translation itself. It is the clear voice that changes the living saints and brings from the graves those who are dead in Christ. The Bible teaches that this will all be in the twinkling of an eye. It does not mean as fast as your eyelid closes over your eyeball. The scripture teaches that it will be even faster than that. Then we which are alive, those that are living on the earth when he comes, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That will be the greatest space trip of all the ages. The word air has to do with a sphere somewhere out in the universe. God has appointed a place where we shall join our Savior and never be separated from him again. The Bible teaches that all the Christians will celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. This will be the most magnificent spectacle the universe has ever witnessed. The morning stars will sing together. The angelic chorus will sing. The orchestras of heaven will play such music as mortals have never heard. Christ will be crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. Those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior will participate in this climactic event of the ages. Jesus once said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. This is the place that is described in detail in Revelation chapter 21 when seven new things will be manifested on that occasion. One of them will be the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. This new Jerusalem will be the home of the bride, which is composed of all true believers. The church is not now the bride of Christ. She is the body of Christ. When the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven, she will be prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It seems almost impossible for us to imagine that these events are going to be. There are many mysteries connected with them. We can only catch little glimpses in Scripture. We are told that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that believe. The only thing that makes us fit for the presence of God is the finished work of Jesus Christ and nothing else. None of us are fit to be presented on that glorious occasion. Our only claim at that hour, our only song will be, In the cross of Christ I glory. In the book of Revelation, we read these words, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto God kings and priests. Here for the first time, will be a genuine United Nations, united in Jesus Christ from all the nations of the world around his throne. And that United Nations will succeed. The Bible teaches that the bride on that occasion will be adorned with the righteousness of saints. This righteousness has been provided by Jesus Christ. We've not added lust or any good works that we have done on this earth. The scripture teaches that salvation is of the Lord. We're not saved by our own works or goodness, but by the grace of God through Christ. I do not deserve to be present on that occasion, but I'm absolutely sure that I will be there, not by my own works or goodness, nor because I've preached to great crowds of people with the privilege of winning many into the kingdom of God. I will be there solely on the merits of the shed blood of Christ on the cross. Sometimes people ask, what are we going to do in eternity when we get to heaven? There will be plenty for us to do, for we will be occupied in the ages to come with what he is going to do. We read in Ephesians 2.7 that in the ages to come that we might show the exceeding riches of his grace to his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In the ages to come, he is going to show all his heart's desire toward us. We are not to be concerned with what we are going to do, for we shall be occupied with him. What a prospect and what a hope. No wonder Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 
In the meantime, we're not to sit down with folded hands and await his coming. We are to be busy in our witness. We are to intensify our efforts in evangelism. I'm more convinced than ever before after our tour of Latin America this year that the time is short. If we are to evangelize, we'd better do it now. This is why we are taking one crusade after another, reaching as many people for Christ as we can while the door is open and before the night comes. We ask all of you listening to my voice to join us as prayer warriors around the world, people that support and pray and help us in this ministry of evangelism. But also to many of you that are listening to my voice who are not ready to meet Christ, you have never received him as your savior, then you are not prepared, you are not ready, and this hope is not yours. Because for those outside of Christ, the coming of Christ will mean judgment and tribulation such as the world has never known before. And the only escape is going to be in the cross of Jesus Christ. Will you repent of your sins now and receive him as your savior? Will you Christians rededicate your life at this moment and say, oh God, I want you to have all of me at this hour? Shall we pray? Our Father and our God, we thank thee for a hope such as this that thou hast seen fit to reveal and to give to us. We pray that we shall be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord until that glorious day when we shall meet thee in the air. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.